Okay, class, now it's time to learn about one of the most important events in all of American history, and it's also one of the most catastrophic. When we think about the Great Depression, we have to see it for what it is, a failure of capitalism. The rampant, laissez-faire, capitalistic growth of the 1920s is going to lead to this economic collapse of catastrophic proportions. So let's look at the causes of the Great Depression in a few steps. First, one of the key factors of the collapse of the American economic system was the fact that throughout the 1920s, there was overproduction of goods and eventually by the end of the 1920s, underconsumption. In other words, there was a lot more supply than there was demand. And the reason for that is very simple. Most of the goods that were being sold during the 1920s were durable goods, goods that last a long time, goods that you don't need to go and buy another item. You don't need more than one refrigerator. You don't need more than one car. And those things last for a long time. People did not need as many appliances and cars and radios by the end of the decade. So by the end of the 1920s, companies were starting to see a reduction in their sales. There was too much inventory and not enough people to buy those products. Second major factor that we need to consider relates to the farmers. So there were a lot of problems for the farmers and the farm industry. After World War I, there was a decline in a demand for agricultural products. All kinds of demand during World War I, but you can see on this chart that after World War I, the demand for farm products just dropped dramatically. And because so much farm production had been happening over the 1920s, farmers ended up in a really difficult spot. Many of them just couldn't pay back loans that they had taken out to support their farms because now there was a lot less production demand for the farm goods and that meant prices dropped and so they couldn't even pay back their loans. So look at the level of farm mortgage foreclosures. People were losing their farms. So on top of this overproduction under consumption problem, we also had a problem for farmers and their industry. And in addition to that, Railroads and textiles and coal companies were losing money from all of the new inventions that had come along, like natural gas and cars and more synthetic fabrics so that you didn't need to make clothes the same way anymore. So some of the innovations also affected the industry in negative ways. So farmers and production of certain goods were really taking a hit in the 19, at the end of the 1920s. One of the other key factors, the third key factor, is the fact that a lot of Americans by the end of the 1920s were in debt. When you go to buy a car, you need to borrow money to do that. When you go to buy a refrigerator or a radio, all of these new inventions, these durable goods, cost a lot of money. And people borrowed money in order to buy them, which meant that they had a lot of debt. So if you think about the amount of debt versus savings by 1929, Look at how much debt had increased from the early 1920s to the end of the 1920s. And that is because people weren't saving. They were actually borrowing money from the bank in order to buy all these products. The fourth concern is the fact that there was a huge uneven distribution in wealth. We talk about the 20s being the roaring 20s, but in fact, it wasn't roaring for about 70% of the American population. The decade was definitely not as wealthy as it appeared. And despite the fact that you had wages going up, the gap between the rich and the poor dramatically increased. If you look at this pie chart, you can see it very clearly that 65% of the American people lived below what was considered a decent standard of living. The wealthy in American society, people making $10,000 and over or even $5,000 and over, were less than 6% of the population when 2,500 was considered just a basic living wage. So the vast majority of the American population was not benefiting from this roaring 20s time period. And over 70% of them would be considered poor by the standards of the time. So think about all of those factors, add them all up, and then you get the spark that will lead to the Great Depression. And that spark is the stock market. In the end of the 1920s, the stock market had grown dramatically. It had soared through the 20s as people borrowed money to buy stock. Stock is basically just buying a piece of a company. And as people purchased these stocks, 
the stock value went up because more and more people were buying refrigerators and cars and radios, and these companies were making a lot of money. So it was a good investment to purchase stock. But the fact that these companies by the end of the 1920s started to have problems with their businesses, there was too much supply, not enough demand, people started to get a little scared about the stock market. And although the stock market soared throughout the 1920s, it wasn't regulated. People were allowed to borrow money from the bank to buy stock. So think about this for a minute. I can go to the bank. I can take out a loan for $100. I can take that loan and go to the stock market and buy $100 in stock. The stock value goes up. I sell that stock. I pay the bank back and I keep the profit. That's the American dream. I'm not doing anything and I'm making a profit. But what happens if the stock goes down? I lose that money I borrowed from the bank and I can't pay the bank back. What do I do then? And that's exactly what happened on October 29th, 1929. It's called Black Tuesday. The stock market crashed. People rushed to sell. And as they started to sell, more people sold. There was a panic. People started selling massively and the stock market just plummeted. Speculators who had bought stock with bank loans now couldn't pay the bank back. People lost billions of dollars on this day. About 4 million Americans or 3% of the nation's population owned stock. But think about the impact on the people that didn't own stock. Because as banks were unable to get paid back loans that they had given out to these stock market investors, they didn't have money to give the people who had put their savings accounts. So you could be a little old lady who never played the stock market, had all your money in the bank, but now the bank closed because it couldn't repay, it couldn't get the money back from the people that had loaned who were playing the stock market. It was this ripple effect that spread throughout the entire community. Because as people rushed to sell, stocks dropped, investors lost a total of $30 billion. So the stock market crash is absolutely the spark that led to the Great Depression. And it caused a downward spiral because as banks closed, they couldn't loan money to businesses. People got fired. They weren't getting paychecks. Because they weren't getting paychecks, they weren't buying things. Because they weren't buying things, the market continues to go down. This was an absolute, complete collapse of the capitalist system. And not only in America, it spread around the world. Because of the Great Depression, you had a global depression and world trade fell by over 40%. This was going to have an enormous impact on the American system, on American democracy, and on our way of life. And the president of the United States, Herbert Hoover, a laissez-faire Republican, his response was, uh, it's okay, the economy will fix itself. But the American people were in crisis. There was a huge need. Think about this chart. This is the sort of American economy, the Dow Jones stock market. You can see how it collapsed in the end of 1929. And because of that, you had 25% of the American population out of work. You had no manufacturing. Companies were closing all across the country. Prices were falling, collapsing, as a matter of fact. And the banks were closing. Every industry in the American system began to contract and the capitalist system completely fell apart. So the question is, how can we fix this? And a man decides to run for president, the governor of New York, a man whose name you will recognize because he is the fifth cousin of Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, governor of New York, runs for president of the United States. And he promises the American people a new deal. And that new deal to fix the Great Depression is his plan for America. And now we have to figure out exactly what that plan is and how he can go about fixing it.